My name is Natasha Jen. I am a graphic designer and a partner at uh, Pentagram. I'm uh, really, really humbled to be here today um, to Adobe Max. Um, this is my first time um, here. I've heard a lot of great things about um, the conference and it's really exciting to see that um, it's a full house here. So um, my topic today is called design controlled chaos. Well, since I'm a designer, um, I'm, I'm being asked a question about, first of all, if I consider myself um, a creative at all. I guess I do. But I'm a little sort of just irritated by, um, by the term creativity here. And I know that we're here to celebrate um, creativity. Well, so uh, let's, let, let's just look at the, 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 the products about um, creativity, um, particularly here through um, publications. So if you Google, um, if you go to Amazon and if you search uh, creativity in books, you'll get 30,000 results. No kidding. And if you somehow filtered um, the, the, you know, the, the, the criteria with, say, creativity in self-help, you will get about 6,000 results. That is mind-blowing. There are 6,000 books about creativity in the um, self-help category. But as you just as you look at um, these you know, um, book covers and their titles, and some of them, I have to say, are really, really great. One thing in common is that there's basically no commonality between any of these books. There's, there isn't a shared history. There isn't, you know, um, certain particular one singular context. There isn't a singular industry. Um, the books are not applicable to the same set of people. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that the, the, the idea the kind of very mysterious idea around creativity is essentially about two things. And these books are ultimately about two things, but with different emphasis. One is about ideas, the ability to actually create, generate um, creative ideas, I guess, you know, and ideas are novel, ideas are experimental, our ideas are sometimes you know really scary given that they can be really novel and then there's this other camp that's really about different methodology to work with ideas and um, by working with i mean to discipline these ideas to put the ideas um, to work to uh, motivate more ideas for example so you see that there's this kind of you know, uh, paradox when it comes to creativity. And this paradox is really about these two completely um, different, if not oppositional, things. And they're so different in nature. So if we kind of zoom out from, um, from our own profession, from design, if we kind of zoom out from the practice of business, for example, particularly um, management, um, there are a lot of really interesting um, allegory out there in um, pop culture that is really about this kind of really troubled and intertwined relationship between ideas, novel ideas, and then this method to control these ideas. Jurassic Park, um, to me, is uh, really the best um, example. Not only that, when this film um, first came out, I remember it was around 1993. I was, I was in high school. Um, I was in Taiwan, and I and I went and watched this film. I was blown away by it. Not because that it was really groundbreaking in terms of you know the storytelling. It was groundbreaking in its incredible imagination and its you know storytelling. It was groundbreaking in that it somehow just encapsulates so many complicated ideas about a lot of different relationships, meaning our relationship with creativity, our relationship with technology, our relationship with being able to control 
um, something. So you know, I, I I know that you're all really familiar um, with 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 the story. Now that you know, it's how many years you know um, in the making? Fifteen years, but the formula here is really really um, interesting. That first of all, there are uh, incredible ideas, novel ideas, ideas about um, being able to create life right out of um, out of a lab therefore it's a technology story it's a biotech technology it's about generating life from our known methodology but then what's underlying here in the story is this total chaos and the result is always some sort of chaotic um, outcome that then gets managed and then it breaks up again so you guys are probably really familiar with this guy. Do, do you, uh, who actually knows who he is? Who has watched Jurassic Park 1? Okay, many of you, right? So uh, in the film, his name is Dennis Nedrick. He's this really sort of, you know, disgruntled um, engineer who uh, was being uh, paid by, you know, this corporation to actually smuggle the embryos, the dinosaurs' embryos, um, out of the lab. So there's this scene. Oh, actually, what he came up with um, was really a genius uh, invention. So here you kind of see that they're trying to put the embryo in this shaving cream can, right? That itself is a novel idea, yet it's a kind of, you can say it's a kind of invention, you know, really incredible technology invention um, right there. So his idea was to actually put the embryo in the can and then, you know, smuggle it out of the island. But then what happened um, was very interesting. So good. All right, so while we're all focusing on Dennis being killed, Here's that can of embryos. What happened? It just got out in the wild. And then it was total chaos after that because all the dinosaurs, the embryos that were contained in that can just got out. Well, what does that tell us? For me, there are a couple of things there. One is that, first of all, I think it's a kind of higher idea is that life really finds its own way to be something and do something and it's really impossible to try to predict how life is going to behave that's one thing but life or the ideas of life really come from living creatures meaning us and that itself is highly unpredictable so now going back to these two things here you know novel creative ideas versus methods I feel like we're sort of in an age where we're actually obsessed with both, like extremely obsessed, given that there are just so many publications and events and conferences about those. But then ideas are really kind of hard to actually put into any kind of formatted and understandable uh, template. Therefore, you see this kind of phenomenon where methods or methodologies is really kind of taking over because that is something that we know. That's okay. I'm not against methodology. You know, I think that everything actually needs some sort of methods to actually make it rigorous, right? But then there's this kind of sort of, again, situation happening right now that methodology somehow has become the idea itself. That itself is really troubling because methodology is this kind of empty vessel that should be different to different situations, right? There shouldn't be a kind of singular prescription with the idea that it can actually apply to everyone. So um, this brings me to design thinking. Um, and some of you might have saw my talk um, about design thinking and particularly um, some of my issues um, around it, you know. Um, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that design thinking is, is bad throughout, but my problem with it and sort of the, the way that it exists 
in um, both the creative and business community is that it somehow has become the idea itself. Therefore, you see, one singular way of doing things has become the kind of dominant thing. Um, which I think is highly, highly problematic. But then on top of that, you see this kind of, um, I would say a kind of belief, you know, again, uh, that, 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 that has been going on for a while is that this methodology, which is actually an empty thing in itself and unto itself, actually equates innovation and actually equates incredible outcomes. I think that, you know, as, um, as designer, we should be I'm personally very skeptical of that kind of um, rhetoric, knowing how difficult design, design anything um, is from an identity to some really, really large program that um, is meant to create social impact. Really, really difficult. So, you know, I, I, I kind of want to kind of bring back this, this very idea that I think is very much in the culture is this kind of one size fits all, meaning that Here's a method, take the method, do it, try to apply it, exercise it in everything that you do with some sort of guaranteed um, result. And my feeling about it is that, well, I'm, I seem like the only person who doesn't fit into that. But then I want to kind of zoom out from design thinking. This talk is not about design thinking. It's about something else and a lot of other um, observations is this kind of idea of can this one sort of answer, you know, however this answer um, came from, be from one some sort of consultancy that created this program and handed it to us, or be some sort of answer that is generated by the public, by the majority. Um, I have sort of issue with two forms of these, but ultimately they're all about one single way of doing things with the belief that that singularity is the only answer. So I kind of want to bring out um, this example, which was actually an art project that took place um, in the late 80s and early 90s by these two um, artists, uh, Russian artists, Molar and Melamed. They're still um, practicing. So um, this project was done before um, the internet. So what I wanted to kind of find out is what is this kind of real people's art, okay? So they started with a kind of research project that they, um, that they embarked over um, 14 countries. Here you see um, these countries are mostly, um, were mostly in Europe. Um, one um, exception is, is China. So what they did was that they actually took, they created a questionnaire. And this is kind of no different from, from focus group. This is no different from our, you know, current algorithm um, based research. It's just that they did it before um, the digital uh, wave. So they went in, uh, they selected, um, again, a good number of people from each country. So they ask them these kind of really simple questions, just questions without a visual, uh, such as your favorite color, you know, um, what kind of pattern do you like? Do you prefer something, uh, you know, modern versus traditional? So out of these answers, they will begin to kind of aggregate, right, the, the, the look of, um, of this um, favorable or favorite painting in each country. So here's an example, you know, um, from, from here in America. Do you like to see colors blend into each other or do you like it when different colors are kept apart? Well, the majority actually like to see colors being blended, okay, whatever that meant. And you see that these questions actually have a visual um, implication right there. So let's just see what these paintings look like. So, well, here's the, uh, you know, sup the supposed favorite painting from America. You see that it's a landscape painting. Very simple and kind of pleasant. You know, there's a very clear foreground and background is always outdoor. There's always um, mountains in the back and trees. And now let's go to friends. Hmm, surprisingly, something quite similar as well. Let's continue. Iceland, Russia. 
So things began to kind of feel a little bit eerie, right? That these countries have completely different culture and um, completely different economy, different you know political systems. But what I liked when it comes to art through this kind of questionnaire somehow look more or less the same. Even in China, it's always a landscape um, painting. The only outlier from this exercise um, was Holland. You see something that's completely abstract. And again, here we're not, you know, taught, we're not trying to think about or answer why Holland um, was different from everybody else. We're trying to even um, proclaim that why Dutch design is better than, than others. But there's a kind of pretty, you know, uh, strange phenomenon happening here is that this is a kind of result um, from doing the kind of quote unquote focus group, you know. And again, I think that as a design um, professional, we, especially myself, you know, um, we, we, we do focus group from time to time. Um, but I have my own skepticism around it, especially when it's applied to visual identity, meaning that you design different logo options where, you know, identity uh, system options, and then you bring it to your sort of segment uh, group and ask them which one they like, and they will probably, you know, tell you that they see different things in different logo, and there's always one sort of favorite logo out of that test. I think that, you know, designing an identity is actually a lot more complicated than that because what we consider is a kind of cultural um, context as well as a kind of, you know, perceptual context out there that our general public, meaning our end users, are not considering. They're only looking at things for its surface value. So. Here's this quote um, by Henry Ford. You know, he once said, well, it's, it's arguable um, whether he said this or not. But the idea is that if he had asked people what they really wanted, they would have just said that they needed a, a faster horse and not a car. Um, so this kind of you know, idea about one single answer that's applicable to all the questions is, is ultimately what I want to kind of talk a little bit deeper about today, particularly in our um, practice in the business of design. Again, going back to these two things, ideas versus control, uh, novelty versus methodology. But I think that what ultimately, what we really kind of live with, you know, day by day, is this kind of very ambiguous middle ground that actually is about both but that is neither nor, and that's what design is really about. And there isn't any kind of singular formula to that, but rather, how do we actually design a condition that we can actually motivate and encourage and promote ideas, but somehow give it a little bit discipline, but not a lot. So going back to the design business, um, I am a partner at Pentagram, and I think that for those who know about Pentagram, Pentagram is kind kind of like a sort of like a strange, uh, you know, um, group. Given that um, we we kind of operate in a kind of very different way. But before I kind of get into um, the Pentagram model, I want to kind of look at the design business. So classically, you will get you know these terminologies that describe a design business. Studio implies something, um, a group that's pretty small. Um, a firm is something that is a lot bigger and that has a kind of structure to it. And the word office is kind of in the middle, you know, where design office, it doesn't imply scale or, you know, structure. And I kind of want to look at um, some work through some really, really well-known designers. Um, can you tell me who designed this? Again? Paul Rand. Yes, this one. Okay, Seagram Building by Mies van der Rohe in New York. This one? You still see it every day, like, you know, on furniture websites. Saarinen, exactly. Ames, right. Who designed this? The legendary Mosmo, right. Tibor, absolutely. All right, incredible. 
talents, right? You know, some of the best design、um, practitioners in history. What happened to them? They all died, <laughs> right? So what happens when、uh, when a studio、um, dies, right? Now let's get back to our contemporary、um, time now. So I think our business now has kind of transitioned from you know this kind of previously. Sort of well-defined terminologies about scale and sizes, and you know, structure, studio, firm, office, to this kind of all-encompassing term called agency.、Um, so, agency is a kind of really interesting phenomenon that I think happened in the last, you know, perhaps 20 years. And I know that you know many of you probably work at agencies, or you know, you 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 run. An agency, and here is not a critique on business model, but rather on the differences between these two ideas, idea and method. So I want to kind of look at our colleagues, you know, and、um, kind of put pentagram side by side within these really great agencies that are still producing really, really great work. So Landor, Lipinka, Wolf Owens, and here's Panagram, and Super Union,、uh, which was Brand Union. They went through、um, a merger this year and became Super Union. So now, really look at the time these firms, including Panagram,、um, were created. Wow, back in the day, really like from something like 40 years ago to say, you know,、uh, Landor that was created 70 something years ago. But what happened to、um, to to these firms? You you find something that's kind of really interesting. They got absorbed, with exception of Pentagram, by、um, conglomerates. So here you see that、um, Landor was absorbed into WPP in '89. Lipinka was absorbed into、um, Oliver Wyman in 2007. Wolf Owens was absorbed into Omnicom in 2001. And then Brand Union was absorbed into Omnicom in '86, and then this year they went through a restructure. So you see, there's this kind of narrative that keeps happening over time. That is, first of all, you have an incredible genius, a real you know design talent that produces great work, and somehow in the history, the genius had always been men.、Um, that's a different topic. But then, okay, continue because the the, the 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 talent was just so incredible that it attracted attention、um, from a large holding company. So the holding company absorbed the talent into this larger、um, group. But what happened after that is that in order for the holding company to kind of manage talents, meaning this kind of exuberance, they really had to install. Some sort of classic management system into the place. So here you see that a kind of very tiered hierarchy began to happen. And again, this is not a critique on business models, on company structures. Most companies out there are structured、um, this way, including a lot of design and you know creative agencies. But what happened is that okay, the the the, the notion is that okay, let's sort of install this. Manageable and predictable、um, system into this creative organizations. Therefore, we can actually grow, right? But ultimately, I think is again, it's really about this dichotomy that the, the the artists, you know, or the designers, the creative on the left, you know, are those who are unable. To manage, therefore, you actually need management to come in and manage them. So you see that there's this kind of, you know, disproportional emphasis on between creative, between creativity and management, with the goal to actually make things a lot more predictable. And because things are actually predictable, then you can actually grow them、um, over time, over different locations. But then what happens is that. Not everything, especially people, are predictable. So you see that there's sometimes a lot of these reorg happening、um, within these large、um, agencies, 
particularly when, say, the creative you know, group felt that the top management um, was disconnected from their um, struggles and from their challenges. So here comes um, Pentagram. So Pentagram was created um, 45 years ago by five um, designers, you know, uh, three are graphic designers, one uh, was an industrial designer, the other was an architect. And it was kind of really created with this idea of that we, as designers, we wanted to actually continue to be creative and, you know, create ideas and perhaps be novel um, some way, somehow, but we also want to kind of manage ourselves. So it was very much this kind of designer's republic um, idea. And a lot of kind of, you know, fine um, system within Pentagram was actually devised by Colin Forbes, um, who, you know, was one of the um, sort of, he, he was really the mastermind behind our system um, today. So what is Pentagram? So first of all, as I said, started out by five uh, creative. And what I want to do is, first of all, they each of them really wanted to um, maintain their autonomy, their creative autonomy, meaning that none of them wanted to be governed by someone else. And then they also wanted to actually share resource, for example, you know, um, such as the, the, the cost of the rent, some sort of common resources. But then this group can actually absorb more people into it based on that kind of very, very simple idea. So each partner at Pentagram maintains autonomy, you know, in a kind of pretty thorough way. Um, we do very different work, we do very different projects, but then the funny thing about this is that um, we're all equal. Um, so it's really a kind of round table organization. There isn't a CEO who makes decisions uh, for us. Every important decision has to be okayed by all the partners. And you can kind of imagine that as the partnership um, grows, you know, as more and more partners join the group, that can become a little bit difficult um, sometimes. And I'm not going to lie about that. But then the other kind of defining characteristic about Pentagram, um, as I said, is that no partner operates exactly the same business. And you may ask, well, then who decides what projects uh, to take on, how you actually build your clientele? The decisions is really up to the partner who's running that um, independent team. So here you see that um, within one umbre umbrella, there are just so many different types of practices happening um, at the same time. It's sort of like a necklace, right? And then the other interesting thing about Pentagram is that because there isn't a singular um, setup, there isn't a singular size, there isn't singular, there isn't a singular clientele. Each team, each group actually generates different revenue. Okay, so that again is another sort of mind-blowing things um, to people. How can you actually all work under one umbrella, being on the same platform, but have different revenue? Well, here's the thing. So the different revenues from different groups would then get summed up into one total. And that total would then get equally distributed back into each group. So this is a socialist idea at work. So what this does is that actually creates this kind of very natural and unwritten check and balances amongst different groups. Each group is sort of like a design um, office onto itself that, first of all, you want to be as creative as possible. And by being creative, you may not be the m most behaving sort of business person. But then, once you're in a socialist system, when you actually share your profit or your loss with other people, other groups, inevitably you have to kind of manage yourself and pay a lot of attention to your business. And this is a kind of really, really critical idea about Pentagram. There are no um, actually rules or methodologies kind of written on paper as to how we do it, but then we just all naturally know how to do it. So, um, you may say, well, 
Let's go back to this. So the way that you know we make decision、um, is through committees, and again, each partner will be part of a different committee, and these co each committee will kind of take take care of different、um, important you know issues, and then report back to、um, the whole group. Again, this is a kind of roundtable、um, kind of decision making. But then the the kind of beauty of this setup is that this actually allows for. Different types of creative business or you know creative minds to join the group, and each time there's a new different creative joining the group, the fabric of the organization, our practice, also changes a little bit too.、Um, and now in 2018,、uh, we have I believe 22 partners. We just you know elected、uh, two new partners、uh, recently, so this doesn't actually. Uh, you know, capture everyone here. But what's kind of really interesting is that, first of all, just from looking at the pictures, you notice that there are different generations, right? All working on the same umbrella. There are、uh, very different kind of, you know,、uh, cultural backgrounds as well. You know, going from someone like Michael Beirut to a Paula who have been in the business for decades to newer partners like myself or Luke and Jody. Um, in London, and you don't see other creative business that kind of celebrates diversity the way that we do. So again, going back to these two models, right? One is a kind of more pyramid-based、um, model that is highly predictable that can be replicated, versus、um, pentagram on the left that again has to be managed and has a kind of inherent management system. Within, but it's actually managed by the creative, and the management kind of changes over time as new partners、um, join. So going back to this kind of really vague, you know, abstract、um, image about how to actually operate within these two、um, two ends of the spectrum is not about choosing sides, either this or that, but rather how do you actually craft. Something that is suitable for you and your organization in the middle. And now, looking at me myself, so I joined、um, Pentagram in 2012. You know, as a partner who actually didn't bring big accounts、uh, into into the organization, and that was actually okay. So it, this is a really sort of summarized view on、um, the growth of my practice within Pentagram. So you can see that you know, first of all. The nature of our projects、um, has actually become more and more complex. Not only that, just the quantity itself has grown very organically、um, over time. And I have to say that you know the work that I have been doing and the work that I'm actually able to do is really a kind of byproduct of the Pentagram、um, model that is really about encouraging creativity. And having some sort of self-controlled system to、um, to manage it. And I kind of want to look at you know、um, projects that that we have done. You know, I don't have too many projects. I have sort of three case studies here that kind of you know、um, illustrates different levels of complexity and sort of things that we had to、uh, struggle with beyond just doing the work or being creative itself. So this project came to us in、uh, 2015. That was a startup and、um, with a very small、uh, budget. And、um, it's Van Leuven、um, ice cream. I don't know how many of you here have actually tried Van Leuven ice cream. Can you raise your hands if you have? Okay, we have some here. Well, they still got a big market、um, to grow. But、um, Van Leuven、um, started out in Brooklyn in Williamsburg. Um, by three, still very young people:、um, Ben, Laura, and then、um, Tim. So、um, they started out with this truck, you know, this kind of really recognizable, recognizable truck, just driving around、um, in Brooklyn. And the ice cream was so delicious. First of all, it's all or with all、um, organic ingredients. That they started to kind of gain attention, and they started to put their ice cream into pints and put them in store. So、um, they came to me、uh, through actually my former、um, project manager Georgie, because、um, she and Ben were neighbors. So 
Georgia came to me and said, uh, hey, you know, um, Van Leeuwen is looking to relook at their branding and packaging because they, you know, they're at a point where they really want to grow. But the thing is that they don't have a lot of resource to actually do this. Um, are you going to take it on? So I was already a fan of their, um, of their ice cream. And I said, of course, you know, we'll figure out how to actually manage the logistics part of it, which is actually the fee itself. But also we kind of actually, ma we have to manage our time on that as well. But then we don't, want to, we don't want to compromise the work that we did. So first of all, the very big challenge that I had, you know, the kind of branding challenge uh, is that they were pretty invisible um, in the shelf place. And you see that um, there's kind of a cluster of yellow colored pints, um, those were the Van Leeuwen ice cream, right? So yellow was really kind of the only thing that you can kind of see, but not really, because everything else was really, really busy and noisy. So we kind of looked at uh, their, you know, visual situation just by really looking at everything that they had done, you know, and look at all these things together comparatively. And very quickly, you know, you, you realize that, wow, it's not that there wasn't a system, okay? I think system was sort of less an issue here. It's just that there were too many ingredients here. Um, how many fonts uh, were here at use? And, you know, there are all these different illustration styles. So first of all, we had to really reduce the ingredients before we started to uh, look at a system. And then um, here you see that, you know, more different uh, fonts set in different uh, styles and a lot of sort of different decorative, you know, moves, right? So we're like, well, one of the things that we can do here that first of all is really, really smart, you know, smart in a sense that it will really help them to pave the road for future. And secondly, how can we actually create a system that they eventually could manage? Meaning that we're probably not gonna be able to create, we, and we don't want to create a really sort of complex um, style guide, you know, and I know that um, branding firms are all kind of all obsessed about coming up with the biggest uh, style guide possible. But again, style guide again is a thing that is about control, right? That is about management. But the thing is that once you have that thing itself, here's a prescription, you actually got to have the right people, meaning you have to have the best designers to actually take that prescription and then work with it. And not only following the rules, you know, don't do this, don't do that, but rather take that prescription and evolve it into something that's even better. I think that is a thing that we kind of just don't talk about, you know, um, as, as designers and, you know, we kind of hand people this style guide. Here you go, you know, you're gonna have consistency from now on. No, you won't. So the question, uh, again, going back to Van Leeuwen is that what do we do here? What, what can we do here that's, uh, that's smart, you know, that can actually pave the road for them? We went back, we went back to this logo. Um, the script logo um, is actually a fine logo and sort of that's what we recognized you know immediately is that there was really no need to redraw the logo or to kind of reimagine something else or to come up with different missions and values in order to actually justify creating a new logo um, again, I think the tendency for branding firm is always, you know, that, okay, you got a problem, our solution is a logo, right? So we didn't want to do that. So we thought that, well, the, the, the usage of this logo could be radically improved to the point that this logo can actually be the most recognizable um, thing on a shelf that you can actually, you know, recognize from far away. But then that itself is not enough. How can we actually create a system, again, super simple but effective system that sort of supports, you know, the idea of being recognizable, but then they could also manage at the same time. So we resorted to colors, you know. So we created these um, really beautiful, you know, delicious uh, colors that resonated with um, the flavors of the ice cream. It was just really as simple as that. So we ended up with this, you know. So you see that here, um, the logo was front and center, you know, being 
um, blown up as big as possible so that it has that kind of primacy that you can see far away. But then the colors were really the thing that kind of softened it, that kind of browned um, the logo. And then for the vegan flavors, um, which were something that they were developing at that time, they didn't have a lot of flavors. We just figured out that we had to invert um, the colors so that consistency is created. There's a kind of continuity between these two different product groups, but then both share the same um, basic graphic language. All right, so you see that, you know, that kind of simple idea, almost a little bit stupid, you know, actually helped them to create, um, first of all, to radically change the look and feel um, of the brand, but also help them to actually roll out into um, other mediums, such as, you know, retail stores right now. So uh, they're opening um, a lot more stores right now. When they were talking to us, they only had three locations, um, I believe, one in LA here and two um, in Williamsburg. Okay, so here's a truck, right? I want to kind of keep um, the truck mostly yellow, given that it's something that people recognize on the street. But then we incorporated these really, you know, delicious colors into it. So this is a quick um, animation that just shows the, the project and what we did. Whoops. So, you know, a really low budget uh, project for a startup um, for us actually helped them tremendously. Uh, we're still doing, doing work uh, with them. Um, we have, you know, really become uh, close friends over, over that project. So what happened after they launched the new packaging was that, first of all, I think within the first uh, six months, the sales in Whole Foods increased 50%, which was phenomenal to me. But then um, we ran into them, we ran into Ben on the street like, you know, a year later. We're like, hey, how's the sales in Whole Foods? Oh, no, we've grown 200%. <laughs> um, so you see that, you know, how some really seemingly unattractive and super simple design ideas could actually do a lot, right, to the particular situation that the client um, was facing. And again, there wasn't any kind of formula or methodology to that, you know. It was a lot of observation, a lot of analysis, and a lot of, you know, perhaps novel ideas and hard work that actually created this. So now they actually have 15 stores um, nationwide, mostly in New York and LA and still growing. So now getting into another uh, case study, I think that, you know, again, uh, I was able to do this because, because I, I'm at Pentagram, because of our, um, our business model. Had this been elsewhere, I probably would have been fired. So, so this project, first of all, it was pro bono, okay? And the scope um, kept ballooning, just got bigger and bigger, you know? And because it's pro bono, you cannot charge the client's um, overage. And then also we had pretty limited um, internal resources too. So here you see that, you know, it, it, it's a kind of, it's probably, you have the most difficult things all kind of encapsulated in one project. And then again, I mean, we could have actually said, hey, you know, since this is pro bono, um, since uh, this is probably not gonna end up on some magazine cover or, you know, block, let's just cut corners here and do something really quick. No, we actually poured our, our heart and soul um, into this project. So it was an exhibition, okay? The exhibition had really, really crazy and meaning complex content. It's about 41 buildings that were built as some sort of self-sustainable systems. 
meaning completely detached from the outside world, from the air ventilation system to electricity to um, sewage, so on and so forth. Everything had to be self-sustainable. So there were 40 cases in history that were designed to actually test those ideas. So you can kind of imagine that each building is an incredible um, story. So this is a list of the 41 buildings. I don't know why it was 41 and not 40. But anyhow, we had to kind of figure out how to deal with this kind of really, really interesting but complex um, content. So here's an example um, one of, from one of the stories. So this was actually in Cleveland. It's a um, sanatorium. It's called the Cunningham Sanatorium. And this thing was built in the 20s, okay, with the idea that if you create some sort of self-sustained um, oxygen uh, system and you put patients into these oxygen chambers, it will help people to heal, right? Things like this. So um, what we also had to work with was these really, really complex energy systems, meaning diagrams that actually talk about how each building works, right? How do you actually work with these things was a big question. And then there are all these different typologies to actually categorize these buildings. So you see that the layers of information just kept building up, building up. So it wasn't like, hey, we got 41 buildings. Let's just do something with it, right? So first of all, we kind of zoomed out. Like, you know, we put all these layers of complex information aside. We asked ourselves, well, you know, if the idea about these buildings is really creating a kind of enclosed system. How can we actually do that graphically? How can we actually create an identity um, for this idea? And if you think about exhibitions, you know, exhibitions sometimes don't need a kind of really strong graphic identity given that it's very experiential, right? People walk through the spaces to actually create things. But the space that we had, which is a storefront for art and architecture, it's a super, super small space. You'll see um, that's sort of like like a wedge, you know, like a cheese wedge, that there really isn't a lot of uh, square footage to create really rich experience. So we thought that, well, graphic here, particularly type, can actually uh, create, you know, uh, a very impactful uh, experience. So what we did is that we created this typeface uh, that, as you can see, is really tight. You know, it's a kind of really, really closed system onto um, itself. And then this is uh, the identity for the um, for the exhibition, closed world. And you see that there is a kind of structure that's being um, that's being made um, with type. And then this type then 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 can express content, right? So the content here you see them on the screen. But if you think about these content, you know, through type being spatialized, it can become quite an uh, interesting um, experience. So what we did, again, um, it was no budget with very, very little production budget, is to actually create, our solution was cre cre to create these um, 41 cylinders. So within each cylinder, there is a story, right, about the building. So on the exterior of the cylinder is a really provocative question um, about that building. But then on the inside, once you kind of get into a cylinder, is where you can kind of turn around and begin to actually read and look at historical photos and diagrams, so on and so forth. So it's a kind of inside, outside experience that we created. And here you see that, you know, the space is really small um, and really, really dense, you know, which actually created a kind of nice experience, you know, feeling that you're actually in a kind of enclosed um, system as well. So this is a view without any people there. So you see that, you know, it's, it's a sandwich. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of wedge uh, situation with this long wall on the side. So what we want to do with that wall, it's pretty difficult when you have a wall, right, and not having budget to do any kind of digital immersive media. So what do we do uh, with a wall? So what I want to do with that wall is that we want to actually make it a timeline. It's the timeline of these 41 buildings. Not only that, we, wa we want to make this wall a kind of publishing center where you see that there are these little um, pamphlets um, being hung on the wall. Each one is actually a small booklet about the building. So visitors could actually take <coughs> which, whichever um, booklets that they were interested in and read these, you know, longer um, at home. 
So it was sort of a kind of really low-tech um, approach to actually deal with these layers of information and create a kind of more sensorial um, experiences. Okay, so the floor um, actually has numbers of these buildings that actually correlate to what's actually in the pamphlet. So this is the, um, the facade itself. Okay, so this is a kind of, you know, uh, a video about um, our, our work. Going from um, exhibition, oh, so this was the opening night, and um, this was actually the most um, attended exhibition at the, in, in storefront um, history over 20-something uh, years. But then the thing is that it's still a pro bono project, right? But we're not done. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, storefront wanted to, I mean, the exhibition was a was a was a hit. Uh, people really really liked it. So they were like, "Well, can we have a book?" Right. So we thought, "Well, sure, let's do a book." So um, as you know, doing a book is really really labor um, intensive. So uh, we have been actually the book uh, I think just got published, not in the market yet, but we're working on this book for more uh, than a year, pretty much every day. Um, the setup is really, really simple. You know, we create a kind of really nice structure that um, organizes, you know, different types of content really well. So this is a story about the Cunningham Sanatorium. But then it was just a labor that was required to actually do it, you know, fixing all the racking, fixing all the, you know, very detailed information, so on and so forth. That actually took um, a lot of time. All right, so doing books, right? But now we're gonna get into something that is a lot bigger and um, a lot um, vague, you know. So uh, since 2014, we started to get into things that involve um, new technology that actually uh, had or still has very undefined market and then, because the client groups tend to get a lot bigger and a lot more proper, you know, um, brands, so the client apparatus also became a lot more complex than some of the, you know, smaller projects uh, that we that we did. And then, because these are new technologies, uh, they always somehow encounter this what, what I called a new cultural challenge, you know, that is actually not so much um, about the market or, you know, the segments of the market, but rather is how people feel about it. And I think that now, yes, with algorithm, you know, with, with how, we, um, how we engage with digital media on the phone all day, a lot of things about us can actually be analyzed, right, by groups, you know, from what we like, what we don't like, so on and so forth. But then, with new technology that never existed before, um, it's still quite hard to actually understand um, how people feel about it. So, um, we have been working with the area of AR and uh, VR um, since, off and on, since 2014. And um, because I signed NDA, I cannot actually show you um, the projects that we, we have been working on. But I have to say, you know, it's been a really kind of incredible, um, fun ride, you know, starting out with 2014 that um, we were contacted by a VR um, startup, right, at that time. And um, I think everybody, you know, including ours, um, us and a lot of critics and other design professionals were 
either blown away by、um, VR once they experienced it, or had a lot of skepticism、um, about it. And I think that condition has not changed、um, much. Although you know, four years later, looking at how sort of vibrant this whole AR VR、um, industry has become. Four years actually felt a little bit like four decades.、Um, it's just really how much, right? This、um, technology has advanced. But then,、um, when when we're working on、uh, a, a identity or branding project for、um, an emerging technology, you know, here it's about VR and AR. Ultimately, it's not just about the kind of visual system. That we come up with, you know, the identity itself, but rather is really having a good grasp on cultural and perceptual、um, condition of that technology, and then that would have that would then inform how we think about narrative and how we think about naming things, for example. Naming for AR VR is actually,、um, I think, a lot. A lot more interesting than say, figuring out what the logo、um, would be, and we have done a lot of、um, work in that area. But then, okay, now what we what we what we had to do, and what we've been doing, is to really kind of understand、uh, these disciplines in a kind of very thorough sense, not just its market share、um, by region, but rather what is the history that. People, meaning innovators, technologists, inventors, engineers, computer scientists, brands, have actually walked down. So this is a view、um, of one of the first、uh, commercial VR businesses called VPL.、Um, VPL no longer exists.、Um, it was created by this. I, I think he's a real visionary. His name is Jaron Lanier.、Um, looking up. Um, he,、um, I believe, is now at Microsoft,、um, more as a kind of consultant. But、um, in his early days, this was actually in the、um, in the early、um, 80s. He was really trying to create the first commercialized、um, VR experience, and it wasn't so much about the gadget itself. It was really about the profound difference between our real world. And what you could potentially experience in this virtualized, you know, infinite、um, environment, and he had incredible philosophy on that. It's in some of his books. But then、um, we realized that, well, you know, VR actually is nothing new. And again, this is 2000. This was 2014.、Um, that there's a whole history about attempts or experiments on creating this kind of Self-contained immersive experiences through wearables. Okay, so it's always a kind of helmet that people imagine that other people will put on.、Um, the guy on the upper right,、um, his name、um, is Ivan Sutherland.、Um, he is really one of the earliest,、uh, you know, VR、um, innovators in that area. He started to experiment with VR, you know, like the device that you're seeing right now. Um, as early as the 50s, but then you know we kind of looked at this this sort of very romantic and、um, ambitious notion that okay, what does AR do, right? So the biggest sort of ambition, I think, one of the biggest ambitions about VR, you know, in a kind of、uh, in a kind of cultural sense, is that it's meant to actually replace screens. So there's this whole you know sort of A lot of you know thinking,、um, as well as you know,、uh, cautionary stories on on screens and our relationship with screens, and、um, therefore there is this assumption that VR、um, was there to liberate us from、uh, from the imprisonment、um, of screens. But then that I think has not、uh, happened yet. And in 2014, we kind of went in with that assumption that. Um, VR would actually create, would actually replace, you know, phones and a lot of、um, computer screens. But that, that is not happening. I don't think that is going to happen. And you see that、um, there, there were other、um, attempts to actually think about this kind of digitized 
experience inside a physical world, you know, and we now call it um, AR. And then at, back in the day, you know, this was kind of a new thing that people actually didn't know um, what to call it. And the other thing that uh, we kind of went through too was the kind of, you know, cultural um, and perceptual resistance on um, VR, you know, particularly, um, specifically when um, Palmer, uh, the founder of Oculus, was put on the cover of Time magazine. I think the internet just sort of went uh, crazy, you know. Um, the, the, uh, I, think, I think that kind of, you know, that sort of skepticism, I mean, you know, these sort of fan art, you know, was a form of um, not, not just, not viciousness, but I think it's rather kind of skepticism that was expressed, you know, through internet memes. But then, you know, um, in photography, you still kind of see uh, these images that you're seeing on the left, you know, that, that's sort of what I call the kind of open mouth syndrome um, with, with VR is that you see people are amazed by something with their mouth wide open, but you never really understand what is actually so amazing, what they're actually looking at. So there's that kind of incredible gap that is just impossible for any, any normal human being to actually um, understand. So what does branding do, right, in that sense? And is that an issue around branding? You know, maybe not. And then you will see, you know, this kind of really frightening um, image, in, right? That again, it's a kind of this kind of very romantic idea to actually celebrate, you know, the new uh, paradigm. But then the thing is that the world, you know, not only that the world is not ready for that, the world is probably not in need uh, for that. And then the other thing that we also observe is observe is that, you know. VR's function in um, entertainment, particularly gaming, was pretty convincing and pretty obvious. Like you can kind of um, imagine that a gamer can actually put on this headset and be really kind of immersed in the environment and have a great time, you know. Um, particularly games about um, adventure, about journey, about battle, you know. All these things that actually require a person to spend time in it, right? So we see that VR had that kind of great potential. But the thing is that, you know, VR companies, most of them um, who actually come out in the consumer market, don't want to be just cornered as a kind of gaming company or, you know, as a device that's for gamer too. They all want to actually come out with the idea that this is actually a utilitarian tool as well with a lot of things that can just help you um, live and work better for example I think that case is still yet to be established you know you see that a lot most of the content out there are still mostly entertainment and there's a lot of value in that you know there are certain um, short films or games that I find um, really really inventive but then moving away from functions you kind of look at two completely different perceptual Fields. That's how different things look. So when um, when we're working with a mixed reality company, so note I've moved on from VR to mixed reality. Um, in 2015, one very big question is that we wanted to help them to um, answer and mostly I think to understand is a kind of profound per perceptual um, differences between really established sort of higher end consumer technology goods to the gaming world, okay? So again, gaming world, gaming content was obvious and they could do that right away. But then you see that there's this, you know, landscape that at some point the color just becomes really, really dark and, um, and busy, right? You know, and then on the far right, these are the visuals that we gather from content, meaning, you know, entertainment content um, brands. And you see that, you know, for, for, for that category, branding actually really doesn't matter that much. It's really the content and the visual of the content that actually creates um, the brand. So how do we actually think about that? I think most importantly, we want to help them to kind of understand that how can we actually make something that is utilitarian, but not just utilitarian, but incredibly beautiful. 
while keeping some of the entertaining um, qualities as well. And again, you see that these kind of these kinds of questions are not something that you can necessarily generate by a kind of pres prescribed um, methodology. It was really just getting into it and kind of do a lot of research, do a lot of questioning, um, and came up with these you know, really, really critical questions. So now, moving on, um, when Pokemon Go introduced this game, I think the world, for the very first time, understood what AR actually meant, you know, especially mobile um, AR. And you know, the whole world went crazy, including myself. It was really, really fun to, uh, to, to play with it. And then, you know, a couple of years um, have gone on and we have been using AR um, a lot in our life without actually knowing that it's AR, right? So, you know, AR as a kind of medium has already permeated into our lives. But these, uh, you know, applications are still in the kind of novel, really, really novel categories, particularly, you know, on um, social media. So you see that, you know, um, major technology brands, you know, here Google um, and Apple have both put out um, their AR developers uh, kit, SDK, um, around uh, the same time, you know, with several months um, in between. So you see that there's this real push on consumer mobile-based AR from big technology brands, which is something that I think is worth celebrating. And ultimately, what they have been trying to do and they are uh, doing is to actually think about how AR can actually become not just a functional, but a necessary tool in our life through the mobile device, through the phone that we're already familiar with. So it doesn't require us to put on, you know, this really weird um, headset or uh, glass, right, to actually do that. But all this is really great, but one thing that I would like to sort of continue to think about and perhaps be able to answer is that our relationship, meaning that our, you know, physical relationship with our phone is a kind of very, you know, downward and inward kind of relationship. Meaning that, like, when you look at your phone, your head is down, right? And you're in a kind of very static uh, condition. And that is universal. So to, that is actually a behavior that we have already formed with the particular design of a mobile phone. But then to actually ask us to actually shift our behavior from this kind of inward static behavior into something that, if, first of all, is our looking and then constantly moving. For example, here, um, you can actually use you know, um, some of the apps to actually project real furniture into a space to try to understand how it fits, right? These functions are really, really great. And you see that these functions are going to um, become more um, accessible and um, more diverse. But then I think it's this kind of relationship that um, we actually need to answer, is how do we actually um, make people to actually change this kind of very much formed um, behavior? So. Ultimately, to put up something on their face, potentially, I know that brands are still pushing for this kind of, you know, holy grail of the ultimate um, glass, one way or the other. But again, how do we actually make people change their behaviors in order to actually adapt? This is a big question. Now, going back to this uh, chart or diagram or graph that I had, is that you see that you know when we're actually dealing with these really complex issues. Um, branding issues that need to kind of think about things not only from the market, from a lot of different angles. There really isn't one particular mythology to it. But then we also want to be incredibly creative as well as responsive to um, the time that we're in. All right, so to end my talk, I'm going to end it with um, a quote from Edison. There are no rules here. We're simply trying to accomplish something. Thank you.